Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? I think you probably can. Good. Welcome to our side event, Collaboration, Climate Change, Adaptation, and Mitigation. The uh, mitigation got lost somewhere along the way, but as you'll be uh, seeing, we will be talking about mitigation as well, so it's Collaboration, Climate Change, Adaptation, and Mitigation. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Rüdiger Strempel. I'm the Executive Secretary of the Common Law and Sea Secretariat and I'll be leading you through this event. In the next 90 minutes or so, we'll be talking about climate change adaptation and mitigation in three very different parts of the world. You could actually say they're so far apart that we're talking about three of the four corners of the world. We'll learn about activities in the Danish, Dutch, German, Warden Sea, the west coast of the Republic of Korea, as well as Australia. And I believe that despite the distance between these three areas, and their many differences notwithstanding, we'll find that climate change confronts us with similar challenges. And there's something else we have in common, and that's creativity in addressing those challenges. And I think we need a lot of creativity to address the challenges posed by climate change. This is a joint event organized by a number of organizations, Climate Planning, Australia, the Korea Marine Environment Management Corporation, the Korea Institute of Ocean Science and Technology, the Ministry for Energy, Transition, Agriculture, Environment, Nature, and Digitalization of the German Federal State of Schleswig-Holstein, and the Common Warden Sea Secretariat. So I imagine some of you are wondering, what is the Common Warden Sea Secretariat? CWSS, as it's abbreviated, is the coordinating body of the trilateral Warden Sea cooperation between Denmark, Germany, and the Netherlands. It's much the same as UNFCCC, in a way only a lot smaller, of course, because um, after all, UNFCCC has a global remit, whereas our immediate mandate is far more limited. The trilateral Warden Sea cooperation is the cooperation between Denmark, Germany, and the Netherlands for the protection of the Warden Sea. This cooperation has been in place since 1978. And one point I always like to stress as a lawyer, because I think it is remarkable, it's not based on any instrument of international law. It's strictly based on political cooperation. So there's no convention, no agreement. There's political cooperation. Three countries decided in 1978 that the Wadden Sea needed to be protected jointly. So next year, we'll be celebrating 40 years of cooperation. 40 years is a fairly long time. So why are these countries doing that? Well, let me tell you a few things about the Wadden Sea. The Wadden Sea extends along the Danish, Dutch, and German North Sea coasts, along a distance of approximately 500 kilometers. It covers an area of about 14,000 square kilometers. It's the largest unbroken stretch of tidal mudflats worldwide in which natural processes are allowed to unfold in a largely undisturbed way. The Wadden Sea, even though it's a fairly limited area, is of global significance. For the geological dynamics that it displays, for its ecological processes where natural forces and dynamics prevail, and for its biodiversity. The Wadden Sea is home to approximately 10,000 species of plants and animals, of which around 200 are endemic. And when talking to German audiences, I frequently get the question, um, is one of those species the lugworm? Because the lugworm in German is called Wattwurm, which means Wadden worm. Actually, it's not one of the endemic species. They exist elsewhere as well. The endemic species are um, largely plants and some insects, and not necessarily always very charismatic, but nonetheless, 10,000 species is a lot of species, especially for such a limited area. It's also an important staging area for birds traveling along the East Atlantic Flyway between the Arctic and areas as far south as South Africa. 10 to 12 million birds, migratory birds, pass through the Wadden Sea region every year. In the fall and in the spring, 5 to 6 million birds are in the area at the same time, and again, Considering the reasonably limited size of the area, that's a lot of birds. And it also shows how important the Wadden Sea is as a staging area along the East Atlantic Flyway. So for all these reasons, the Wadden Sea in 2009 received international recognition by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. 
UNESCO thereby acknowledged the Wadden Sea's outstanding universal value. But the Wadden Sea, like many other marine world heritage sites, is threatened by climate change. First and foremost, of course, by sea level, but potentially also by other impacts of climate change. Climate change could irrevocably damage the Wadden Sea ecosystem and pose a threat to the Wadden Sea region as a whole. At the trilateral level, there's only so much we can do in the area of climate change mitigation. That's an issue that has to be addressed on a global scale, which is why we're all here for the next two weeks. What we can do on our more limited scale is work on adaptation. And that's, I'm very, that's why I'm very pleased that um, Dr. Jakobus Hofstede from the Schleswig-Holstein Ministry will be presenting a project related to climate change adaptation in the Wadden Sea region the schleswig Sign Climate Change Adaptation Strategy 2100. The project Building with Nature, which is funded by the EU's Interreg 5B program, is another project of climate change adaptation that we in the Wadden Sea region are currently involved in. Its overall objective is to make coasts, estuaries, and catchments in the North Sea region more adaptable and resilient to the effects of climate change. In the context of that project, we're exploring novel ways of working with nature to adapt to climate change. The essential motor behind building with nature is partnership, as partners from Denmark, Germany, and the Netherlands, as well as from Belgium, Norway, Scotland, and Sweden work together, share knowledge and experience, and come up with joint ideas of adaptation strategies, ultimately creating a network of knowledge from which all can benefit. And partnership is, of course, also indispensable to the Wadden Sea community and for the protection of the site's outstanding universal value. Hence, the trilateral Wadden Sea cooperation. But for us, as a World Heritage Site, partnership reaches beyond the site's boundaries. The UNESCO title gives us the privilege and the obligation to reach out to partners much further afield, such as other marine World Heritage Sites within the UNESCO's World Heritage Marine Program. The Trilateral Wadden Sea Corporation has therefore concluded memoranda of, of understanding with the Islamic Republic of Mauritania and the Republic of Korea. Among our partners in Korea, are our colleagues from the Korea Marine Environment Management Corporation and the Korea Institute of Ocean Science and Technology. The Korean tidal flats on the Wadden Sea share a lot of similarities. They both belong to the worldwide largest and most important coastal tidal flat ecosystems. They serve as major hotspots for migratory birds uh, in, along their respective flyways, and they're uniquely rich in biodiversity, as I mentioned earlier for the European Wadden Sea. Therefore, there's a mutual interest in supporting each other in the protection of these ecosystems and the exchange of experience in management, monitoring, and research. This event is organized in the framework of that cooperation, and both you and, uh, uh, and I will shortly learn more about the Korean Blue Carbon Strategy, and I'm very pleased to welcome our Korean colleagues, Suk Kui Lee and Yong Sik Park here today. Finally, last but certainly not least, we will also listen to a very new partner of ours. Climate Planning is a consulting agency specializing in climate change adaptation planning and on taking to the, um, and, sorry, and um, the presenter from Climate uh, Planning, Donovan, will be adding to uh, the presentations on strategies presented to you today by our colleagues from Schleswig-Holstein and, uh, and Korea and offer insights into related aspects of governance. Therefore, I'm very happy that Donovan Burton will now deliver the first of today's presentations. I will briefly introduce Donovan. Donovan is a climate change adaptation specialist with a diverse portfolio of experience, having completed more than 150 climate change risk and adaptation projects. He's focused on influencing change, focusing on adaptation governance, disruptive technology, and big data. Donovan recently founded the Informed City Platform for Climate Change Adaptation Governance, which has been used to understand the adaptation governance of 230 organizations across numerous jurisdictions. Donovan, you have the floor. Uh, thanks for that. Hello, everyone. Now, I've come from um, an Australian summer, so it's nice to be standing under these lights because <laughs> it's pretty cold outside, um, but it's grounding for me. Um, today, I'm going to give you a very brief uh, presentation. Um, I'll uh, 
justify why I think it's uh, fundamental that organisations focus on governance of adaptation or adaptation governance before they do any activities in the, ad in the climate change adaptation space. I'll talk really briefly about the informed city uh, tool uh, that uh, I developed and I'll put that into context with looking at multi-level sort of uh, governance arrangements and the applications of that tool. So why uh, climate change adaptation governance? Well, you know, I've been working in this space for about 13 or 14 years now, and um, in climate change adaptation, traditionally uh, it has been a focus of undertaking risk assessments and uh, um, uh, implementing adaptation actions. It's very, very difficult to measure, and, and adaptation is actually very, very complex. Um, I think sometimes I wish I worked in the mitigation space because I think, you know, and no offence to people working in that space, I know it's political and, and tough, but greenhouse gas mitigation is, is relatively easy because it's relatively easy to measure and justify and you get um, return on investment. With climate change adaptation, it's actually quite complex. We're only starting to see the uh, cascading impacts of climate change uh, meander through our, um, our economy at the moment. So you might have a, a one risk might be, you know, the increased heat waves or increased uh, incidence of, of flood, but the cascading impacts when we're looking at um, the market ripples, so when we look at insurance availability and affordability, when we look at uh, mortgage risk, uh, these are things that are, are, are new and, and emerging, and it's very difficult for organisations to keep abreast of that. Climate change adaptation is about or should be about informed decision making and to be honest, you know, I've, I've worked uh, throughout South, Southeast Asia and I think there's not much informed decision making going on in this process. You know, it's well intended but um, it's very, very difficult to understand the cascading impacts of, of climate change. I've seen um, adaptation projects that have resulted in, in negative um, outcomes. And um, this often happens because we have that policy window hypothesis where when we have an extreme event, uh, you know, there's a lot of pressure on uh, elected members to uh, deliver something and there's often uh, negative impacts from adaptation. So with the informed city uh, platform that I created, what we do is we undertake climate change adaptation governance assessments of, of organisations. Now, to date, in the, in the past 12 months, so talking about eight years to develop, and in the last 12 months we're in that sort of implementation phase. And so we have um, undertaken the adaptation governance assessment of over 185 local governments in Australia, um, also state agencies, about um, 30 state agencies, state-owned corporations as well. And that represents approximately 11.5 million um, uh, people in, in Australia. We bring that information, so the governance assessments, we bring that in with um, big data anal analytics as well. So we bring in uh, exposure data and vulnerability data to help the decision makers make informed decision making across a range of scales. And I'll just talk really briefly about these scales. So the, the first one is um, at, the, at the local scale. Now for the, for the local decision makers, I'm talking about local governments here, um, and when, I'm talking, when I talk about governance, I'm talking about the main instruments and actions and mechanisms that they, they use to undertake their day-to-day -day activities. So that might mean the land use planning, long-term financial management plans, asset management plans, strategic plans, et cetera. And so for local governments, what we do is we undertake a governance assessment, and for them, it gives them a benchmark, you know, they're, they're new to this, it gives them a benchmark of where those gaps are. We also undertake a sub-local uh, assessment, so we do a survey with all the staff and identify where the barriers and the enablers are um, at each of the departmental level as well. Um, this, uh, I launched this uh, a couple of years ago, and we piloted it with a council in Tasmania and then five councils in, um, in Queensland. One, one of those councils, you can see that photo up there, uh, is the Whit Sunday Regional Council. And when I did the detailed, when I did the gov detailed governance assessment um, for them, they flatlined, they scored zero across all of the 10 uh, scoping indicators, so they had no consideration of it. But um, within 12 months, their, their mayor had decided that he wanted to uh, go from zero to hero, and they've you know, put in about $800,000 worth of um, uh, funds and, and what they are doing now is actually leading in the adaptation space. So for them, they, they felt like this adaptation governance assessment helped them identify the gaps and where to focus. 
at the uh, regional level, so then when you get the collect collection of locals, local governments, you can get that at the regional level. And for those, it's, it really helps facilitate that peer-to-peer -peer learning. So one um, a local government who's, say, not doing so well in asset management can look to another council who, uh, within their region um, who may be doing really well, and that cuts down consulting fees. And local governments always learn off each other, so this is like the, the, the tinder of um, the adaptation space. At the state level, um, it, it's actually informing um, uh, policy making at the moment. So, for for a state government, so in Australia, you know, we ha we have lots of large states, and uh, for a state government, it's not an issue if one local government or two local governments haven't haven't got a good consideration of climate change and its governance arrangements. But if 90% of local governments don't have, you know, say consider climate change and asset management or financial planning, then that actually becomes a sovereign risk for, for the state. And in Australia, they are, um, our local governments are a function of the state. What's happened in, uh, in Queensland is that the detailed governance assessments have uh, uh, resulted in a thing called the Queensland Climate Resilient um, uh, Councils Program, where they are undertaking peer-to-peer -peer learning and um, you know, the uh, funding's being allocated to the councils as well to help them plug those information gaps. Then at the national level, what we're getting, because I've done it for every, every council in Queensland, every council in Tasmania, every council in Victoria, and the state directorates and the ACT. And so what is starting to happen now is those organisations are talking to each other so they can do inter-jurisdictional peer-to-peer learning. So open up the doors for the local governments within their locations to share information with others and outside of the state, but also um, it allows for peer-to-peer -peer learning between the state agencies. Um, at the national level, I think there's a potential uh, application of this tool using this, the power of the sub-national data and feeding that up the food chain, so uh, reporting on UNFCCC or Paris Agreement um, uh, applications, because measuring adaptation is very difficult, but I think it's actually possible. Once again, it supports um, peer to peer learning at that national level. And then I think, you know, at the international level, you know, I'm undertaking an international rollout at the moment. Um, I want to facilitate those international comparisons between organisations. Um, I think that it's a, it'd be a useful tool for the GFC funding arrangements to make sure that. You know, help local governments and, and, and um, regional governments and state governments identify um, uh, where those barriers are for adaptation governance. You know, because I, too often I see funding or multiple uh, uh, funding arrangements go into organisations, a lot of replication going, you know, the money goes in, but no mainstreaming of adaptation actually happens. I'm going to um, conclude with um, just a couple of statements. So, one is that I think, you know, reiterate that adaptation governance is, is critical. You know, if we don't have that, um, we're not going to have informed decision making. We're not going to get mainstream um, decision, decisions undertaken. I think it can act as a really powerful monitoring and evaluation tool. It can test interventions. So some of the states that, are working, that I work with at the moment have taken the results from the, um, the, the governance assessments and they are doing a range of interventions. So they offer funding, they offer training, um, they create templates and fact sheets, but if you know uh, when they go to review those governance um, scores a year later or two years later, if those scores haven't improved, it gives them the ability to test those interventions and maybe try something a bit more firm, so they may do regulatory intervention. Um, once again, as I said before, I think it highlights the value of the subnational. It's fantastic to see in the Paris Agreement that the subnational, you know, is, is recognised and I think it's going to be a driving force in the climate change space, both in adaptation and mitigation. Um, but collaboration is key. Um, one of the reasons why I created this is, is I saw a failure uh, with governments in disclosing their risks. So, you know, if you look at the Carbon Disclosure Project and the TCFD, um, there's, a pr there's pressure on the um, private sector to disclose their risks for them, for, for preventing market failure, but there's very limited pressure at that sub-national level um, for, for governments to disclose what risks they have and how they are managing those risks. And so what I wanted to do is make sure that people publish this information so the market can see you know, what local governments are doing and what state governments are doing.
Because if you're a bank, for example, you know it's really important that your city is um, adapting to the impacts of climate change, because otherwise it's going to present a mortgage risk for your portfolio. Um, the most important thing is that there's transparency and, um, and uh, sharing of data. But I'll leave it there and uh, welcome any questions uh, at, the, at the panel. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Donovan. Um, yes, just one remark. Um, as you know, we're going to have a panel discussion later today, and um, you'll be welcome to ask any questions, uh, but please keep your questions for now, um, because we'd like to carry on with the presentations. And then um, in the course of the panel discussion, you're welcome to address all the panelists. Now, the next presentation is going to be presented by Sukhui Lee from Korea and Young Sik Park, also from Korea. Sukhoi Lee is leading the climate change response team at the Korea Marine Environment Management Corporation. She has a scientific background in the greenhouse gas uh, reduction in energy and waste management sectors. She started her career in climate change response in marine sectors in 2008 and is currently in charge of the national greenhouse gas emissions accounting in ocean and fisheries sector in Korea. Young Sik Park, our second presenter, is Principal Research Scientist on the KIOS Korea Institute of Ocean Science and Technology team. He's been working in tropical marine ecosystems around the Pacific Ocean, and since 2006, he's been participating in ICRI and SPC as a national focal point. He's been studying coastal ecosystem rehabilitation in tropical regions, including blue carbon po pools around mangrove and seagrass areas. In the Korea Blue Carbon Program, he now deals with blue carbon pools entitled Salt Marshes. Sukhui Lee, you have the floor, please. Okay, so then Young Sig Park will start. Is that correct? It's yours. Yeah, okay, so we've changed, we've changed the agenda, but go ahead. But the presentation file is not mine, so. I'm sorry, which, which one do you want me presenting first? Uh, th this one, cost of energy management. Yes. And the blue carbon. In and you, you're course. starting with yeah, You are starting with this, I'm uh, starting with this presentation. Yes, that's fine. Yeah, but the, 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 the file, uploaded one is not mine. Oh. Then. Very sorry for this. We've had a slight change of agendas, but I think we've worked it out now. So um, please. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peng Shik Park. So I'm introduced to carbon force uh, on the tidal uh, marshes in Korea. So my I introduced my the scientific data only. So. Uh, blue carbon program is beginning in, in Korea in this year, so our uh, program will also starting to this year. It takes for five years. So, how can? Oh. Sorry. <laughs> So now, uh, uh, so in Korea, so we are also the first uh, uh, the opportunities to uh, the starting for the uh, blue carbon because uh, we have a huge of the tidal threat uh, comparing to the air, the land area. So long time ago, the we used only the reclamation uh, to the tidal flat. So about 40% uh, of the tidal flat already the reclamated. So because the, our culture is focused on the agriculture, but now, so the Korean and our government also changed the mind about the uh, 
think of the tidal flat. Uh, so uh, now about five years ago, so we are started studying to the reclamation mind to change the tidal flat. Okay, now I introduced the uh, okay, so very hard to see. <laughs> yeah, the tidal pools in Korea, and I explained to our plan and measurement and the application to other method. How can? Okay, so the first time we have some worried about how can try to do the blue carbon program. So the first time we referred to blue carbon initiative report. So the, we have the five steps. The one is define the project boundary and uh, we understanding the project. And after that, we uh, think about the how can sampling and understanding and the data analysis and uh, the national make, make, making the uh, national inventory. Okay, uh, that the the that that is the carbon storage and schematic plot. Uh, the unfortunately, the Korea have no. The mangrove. The mangrove is a main factor on the block carbon, but we divide two kinds of the carbon full. One is the vegetation, other is the sediment. Sediment. The vegetation also including the uh, tidal marshes and the sea glass. And so, as I mentioned, we have issues of the uh, tidal flat area. So, uh, tidal flat means uh, can uh, be carbon uptake. There, so uh, we uh, are uh, the starting to uh, so starting to uh, know about uh, the standing club in vegetation and the sediment on the carbon. So the Korea the. 95 species on salt marshes in uh, living in around the Korea. The, it depends on the various environmental factor. So only uh, three species can be candidate, candidated the uh, blue carbon source. The, the species is, is including uh, reed, okay, reed, and the uh, cord grass and the sieve weed. So uh, the, this year, we summarized the standing club on the major species read. The cold glass is more high, high, uh, high, high the highest the production uh, in the, on the, the, among the tidal, flat, the tidal marshes. But uh, cold grass is the introduced species in Korea now. It's a big issue uh, around the the coastal, the tidal flood area. So our government is uh, uh, trying to eliminate this species. But reed is a major species in Korea, but as I mentioned, so a long time ago, we already the reclamation to the tidal flood. So many of the uh, reed area is already changed to the land. So. Uh, now I just suggest the cold grass be uh, have a good uh, source to the carbon, the blue carbon. And the sea glass, we have nine species of sea glass in Korea. Six species living in the soft bottom and three species in the hard bottom. So this program will be started to next year. So, and I introduced another, uh, our process. So, uh, the, we are very uh, big 
the tidal flood. So some of the area can be accessed, but other areas cannot access the uh, area. So this picture showed uh, the red, red one is uh, dominated the weed, weed uh, community, but we cannot access the, this area. So if you uh, ca calculate the blue carbon, so you have to uh, you, the doing by the airplane. So, and we uh, get the, uh, many of the, the images and uh, trying to the analyze to uh, distribute the, the wavelengths. And so we redrawn re uh, the area of the, uh, the salt marshes. So that's pictures we uh, pictured in the last year. The uh, left one, uh, it, you can see the two kinds of the color. One is the green one, another is orange one. Green one means uh, dominated in the red area, and orange is uh, also the, the weed, weed area. So, uh, and so we uh, need some more uh, confirmation to the, the image. So we try to, uh, again, using the drone. So the data is buried about 20%. Uh, so it means uh, the data quality is, will be uh, considered about how can uh, measure the blue carbon source. That is the uh, vertical distribution uh, studies. So it means uh, the pictures can get only uh, the area, but we need the, the density data so that it all. Okay, that is uh, the, the explain to the uh, sea glass. So we, based on the uh, airplane data image, and next year we already confirmed uh, using uh, by the drone and some other the kit. So in Korea, so only three species can be candidate of the uh, blue carbon source, but really is more important, but uh, we ha now, unfortunately, we have no any area to uh, expand to the blue carbon source. So that is, I introduced another technique so for the unaccessible area. So we using the uh, machine running uh, system also the adapted uh, applied. Okay, and so you, uh, so you. Uh, Produce the uh, inventory, so you have to uh, s uh, make a so GIS program based on the data. So it shows. So our, it, our suggested to our government if we produce the more uh, in the target area, the line. That is the, the Gangwa Island. The, the, they, they have a two, there are two lines, the, it's a blue one and a red one. It means gap about 30 years. If we try to blue carbon and the, it have only two uh, candidates, it's just the, the sky blue area. So, and the, we al already draw the, uh, the subtitle, sorry, the lowest tidal line. It means we can uh, increase the more products to the ship with area. Uh, so, as I mentioned, so we uh, already reclaimed uh, many uh, many area many areas. So, but <laughs> the after the now, so Korean is. Changes the mind. The tidal flat is more uh, important, but blue carbon is more pushed to the uh, important of the tidal flat area. So, because the blue carbon means uh, 
is related to it, the, uh, some the restoration, air, air restoration. So uh, after we, uh, we trying to, after the we uh, finish the, this uh, program and our government will be trying to the restoration uh, the program is. Okay, thank you. Oh, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, may I ask our technicians, do we now have the next presentation? Is it ready for presenting? In that case, I would ask Jacobus to start first. So Jacobus Hofstadter works as Deputy Head of Division, Coastal Risk Management at the Schleswig-Holstein Ministry for the Environment, uh, and he's been there since 2007. His main focus is on policy preparation and the development of strategies in the fields of climate change adaptation along coasts, and public participation in coastal risk management. Jacobus has a PhD in coastal geomorphology, so he's well placed to enlighten us. Jacobus, you have the floor. So thank you, Rudiger, and it's my pleasure to, to present a uh, state strategy, a Schleswig Holstein state strategy on climate change adaptation in a part of our trilateral one C ecosystem. Um, I've already been introduced, so I'll just go on with the second slide. Um, so what and where is Schleswig-Holstein? I can imagine that some of you have never heard about Schleswig-Holstein. So we are the northernmost uh, state in Germany, one of the 16 states in Germany, and we are the northernmost. To the north, we have um, uh, Denmark, and to the west, we see the Netherlands there. And on the slide on the left side, you see actually the trilateral cooperation area. Uh, which Rudy has, Rudiger has addressed already, 40 years of trilateral cooperation on the protection of the Wadden Sea. I think it's a quite a unique uh, effort, cooperating for such a long time on a trilateral level, three states on a voluntary basis. Uh, and I think we are doing very well, and we will continue to do that in the next decades to come. Um, Zooming in on Schleswig-Holstein, like I said, the most northernmost state, you see a satellite image on the, rest, on the, on the right side. Um, we are situated in between two seas, actually. We have the Baltic Sea to the east, and we have the North Sea to the west. And in between, there is this, uh, this small area, about 15,000 square kilometers. It's not large as Schleswig-Holstein, but it's the most beautiful uh, Bundesland of the world, I can assure you, being Dutch and living in Germany now. Um, about three million inhabitants uh, live in Schleswig-Holstein in all, and about 250,000 of them live in the area which you see there in red. And that actually is the area which I will be talking about in the coming uh, 15 minutes. It is uh, a huge area uh, in front of it. It's called the Wadden Sea area. You see that there are large tidal flats. Rudiger has already addressed it. It's uh, worldwide unique, the extension of intertidal flats in that area. And that's actually what we are talking about when we talk about climate change adaptation in the Wadden Sea. Yeah. Um, this, uh, this, this, this cooperation is more or less implemented by regular um, governmental conference. Every four to five years we have a governmental conference in one of the three states. And uh, in 2010, Germany was hosting the trilateral conference on the protection of the Wadden at the island of Zuld, which is a small island. I'll probably come back to that later. And uh, a questionnaire was divided there, and it was asked what actually is the main challenge when you think of it for the one C. And this was more a conservational uh, uh, conference, you may call it. But they all said, with overwhelming majority, you may say, they said climate change and sea level rise is, is the major challenge when we talk about the future of the one C ecosystem, uh, even in front of sustainable development and awareness for the beauty of the ecosystem. So uh, actually, it was a hot topic. And then in 2013, IPCC uh, published its last uh, or its fifth uh, report on, uh, on future changes. And uh, there it was more or less underpinned that, um, that um, sea level will rise in this century. And the thing about it, and that was actually what was addressed already on 2010, is that the fear is that the Wadden Sea may start to drown if sea level rises too fast. 
So that was more or less the topic. And then, like I said, 2013, we had the uh, IPCC report, the last one, and that was more or less the starting point for the uh, Schleswig-Holstein state government to say we have to address this topic, we have to start thinking about our voluntary. Uh, we, all, we are all human, we always want to preserve the situation we have, so the aim of this cli climate change adaptation strategy should be maintain everything as it is today. So structures, functions, integrity, because that, for example, are the goals of the uh, World Natural Heritage Site as well. So we started the project to establish such a strategy in 2014, it was, and uh, the aim is already addressed there, but the, the other thing we thought it can only be a good strategy for the region when we involve everybody who is responsible or has some feeling about that region. So it was not only a state strategy or a state project. Of course, nature conservation was in it, coastal risk management was in that project from administrational side, but we decided that NGOs like WWF uh, F, which has a strong uh, food path over the footprint over there, should be in it. Uh, other NGOs should be in it, and the local municipalities and the, uh, the, the islanders should be involved in the establishment of the strategy as well. So it should be one common strategy for e ecosystem purposes as well as for coastal risk management. And when you start such a project, of course, you have to start thinking about possible futures because you have to start thinking about how may the future look out before, before you can adapt to that. And then when you start to think about possible futures, you have to define them in some way, so you start thinking about parameters. And the starting point always is the climate change, what is coming to us, so increasing temperatures as well as increasing water temperatures, for example, a major challenge in the modern sea. And then from that, changes in climate, we will have changes in hydrology, talking about sea level, talking about tidal range and talking about waves, for example. So we had some uh, parameter on hydrology and these hydrological parameters, when they change, they will have effects on the morphology as well. When sea level rises, the water sea may start to drown. That is, but that's just a hypothesis which we have to uh, uh, concretize then. So morph morphological parameters are major by major part of it, and then finally, as a third step, reacting on climate change, you have the biology. If the hydrology changes, if the temperature changes, if the morphology changes, then the biology has to change as well. So that will then be a successive step. So in all, 22 parameters we, we decided to work on, we defined. And then, again, coming to the possible futures, you have to talk about what may be a moderate possible future and what can be a high end or a raised future, as we discussed it. It should be called raised uh, future. And then not only one time horizon, but then two time horizons is always better than one. So one for the middle of the century, how may the future look like that for these two scenarios, moderate and raised, and one by the end of the century. So in all four time slices, four scenarios. Um, the main uh, um, um, input, you may say, for the change in the water sea, the main challenge was the sea level rise topic already addressed at the Zult conference. And then we have this nice report from 2013 from IPCC, which gives us for the first time, for the first time actually it was given actually sea level rise rates per year in millimeters per year. And that's what you see on these two diagrams there, one for the moderate, the, uh, the RCP 4.5 scenario and one for the high-end scenario, as we called it, the uh, RCP 8.0 scenario. And these two time slices, you see them there on this. I do not know where I can, yeah, no, it's not visible. Um, you see them at the, at the right side. For example, by the middle of the century, we, say we took a value of four millimeters per year of sea level rise. As something that may be plausible, we took it from the IPCC projections on sea level rise. By the end of the century, the moderate scenario says six millimeters, and below it, you see the, in red, you see the values for the high end scenario six millimeters and 10 millimeters per year. And by, just to compare, in green at the bottom, you see the last century we had a sea level rise of about two millimeters per year. So already the moderate scenario by the middle of this century, we may face a doubling of sea level rise rates as compared to the last century. So already with the moderate scenario, we may expect that something is going to change in hydrology, in morphology, and in biology. 
And that was actually then the starting point for our project. Of course, we asked universities, research institutes to join us up in this project. They were actively involved. Actually, we had some cooperations with, with uh, a major research institute in Germany. And we just asked this institute uh, to perform for us hydromorphological modeling, as we say it. They had a good model. Um, and uh, to say how may this tidal basin, that is the Danish German border tidal basin, the Lister Dupe tidal basin, uh, lying in between Germany and, um, and uh, Denmark, what you see at that image was the situation in 2010. In brown, you see the area, the intertidal flats area, so which falls dry when you have low water. And in blue, that is the area that is all the time. Uh, underwater. So it was about 50% is underwater and about 50% in the tidal basin is uh, falls dry. And around high water tide, the whole area is filled up with water. And then we just asked them for the moderate and for the high end scenario, using with this model, how may the situation be then? What you see here in the second uh, image there is the situation in 2100 if we take the moderate scenario. So about half a meter of sea level rise in all that would be. And uh, you see that uh, around the islands, a uh, bit loss of intertidal flats, but still, OK. It's um, not too heavy. But then when we take the, yeah, when we take the high end scenario, you see that it's becoming more and more blue. Actually, when we take the high end scenario, by the end of this century, about half of our intertidal flats will be gone. That is what the model says. It's just a hydronumerical model, but it's quite a sophisticated model. And uh, if we take the moderate scenario, about 15% of intertidal flats are gone. And then we should remember that one of the main nomination criteria for the World Natural Heritage Site, Waddensee, the trilateral Waddensee, was this huge, coherent proportion of intertidal flats, worldwide unique. And then we would lose half of it by the end of this century if we have the high-end scenario, which gives us a sea level rise value of about one meter. So with a one meter sea level rise. We do have sediment import, but we don't have enough sediment import. And that is actually the process. Uh, what are we actually talking about? The, the, the Wadden Sea is a huge, huge sediment sink. There are billions of tons of sediment transported into the Wadden Sea, coming from the North Sea, coming from the rivers. And they made this huge pile of sand over there under a moderate sea level rise. And the problem now is that. If you look at it into the future, will there still be enough sediment to be imported? At the moment, we don't even feel that we still have sediment importation into that area. So actually, when we come to the bottom line, we say that sediment for this huge pile of sand is the problem, but it may also be the solution. And that's when I come to the adaptation strategy. When I come to adaptation, we are talking about sediment. But first. Uh, the consequences of climate change. I said we had, a, we had a common project of nature conservation authorities and coastal risk management authorities, which is actually quite unique in, uh, in, in, in Germany, that they, are com they start working together so closely because they feel they have the same challenge. And actually, when you look at the consequences of climate change, we have seen the pictures before. Uh, they are quite uh, devastating for our existing ecosystem as well. We will lose breeding grounds, we will lose feeding grounds, so we will have a change in ecosystem. And if we want to maintain the present ecosystem, as was the aim of the state government, we have to adapt to that. So normally, nature conservationists do not like to manage a system. Natural dynamics actually is a major goal for that area. But um, perhaps we have to start interfering. And then, of course, we have to look for measures which are very nature friendly, which do not, which support natural dynamics more than that they interfere with natural dynamics. The same problem we have for coastal risk management. I'm, like I said, the coastal risk management uh, uh, manager of the state of Schleswig Holstein, and I'm responsible for building dikes. So if the water depths in front of our dikes will increase because the sea level rises and the water sea, the, the tidal flats do not grow up at the same rate, then we will have a, a larger water depths in front of our dikes. So the, the waves which attack our dikes will be larger as well. So we will have an input increase in hydrographic stresses on our coasts and on our coastal defense infrastructure. So both nature protection and coastal risk management have a challenge there. Um, and then it's about how to adapt to that. And it would, of course, be ideally if we adapt to that in a way that fits both 
purposes of our ecosystem, both coastal risk management and ecosystem. When you start thinking about adaptation, you have to start thinking about some boundary conditions. And one, of course, of the main boundary conditions is um, that we should try to avoid to, re to increase the sediment deficit of the system. Then, if you think about it, we should natural processes introduced in as much as possible. We should further natural processes in order that the tidal, that the ecosystem in itself is able to, uh, to, to respond to the sea level rise. So, in fact, we are talking about increasing the resilience of the one sea to climate change, to sea level rise in specifically. Then we should start thinking about um, unusual innovative measures which should look across the border. But you see there are two examples from our colleagues uh, in, in Denmark, uh, when they build houses there on the island of Rum, you see they are standing on poles. That, of course, is one way to adapt to rising sea levels. So if you have a storm surge there, the water will stand there, the area will flood, but the houses, there will be no damage expectations. And that's actually what you are doing when you are performing coastal risk management. You are avoiding damages to people or to uh, uh, values. And that's what the Danish have been doing by building their houses on poles. The Dutch, they have a more technical approach. They uh, support or they supply a huge pile of sand in front of their coast, 20, 25 million cubic meters have been deposited there in that area. And then the final example, you see that at the bottom, uh, with respect to no regret solutions, we are trying more or less to make our barriers more soft. So not thinking about dikes and sea defenses, but more about giving a, a more softer trans uh, gradient. This is an example for the, from the Halligan, which I cannot go into into detail in 15 minutes. So coming back now to adaptation. Yeah. I have been addressing, I, I hope I have been, been quite clear about it that we are talking about sediment and it's all about sediment. So if we are trying to adapt to climate change, if we want to further natural processes, we should try to balance the sediment deficits that we expect in the Wadden Sea. If we balance sediment deficits, uh, we need more sediment. So we are thinking about where to put that sand in the Wadden Sea. Should we just put it on the tidal flats where we want to, it to, to rest in the end, or should we put it more intelligently in areas like in, in the outer area of the, of the Wadden Sea, and then the nature will bring it in. So furthering natural transport processes that might, might be more sound. Uh, actually, the Dutch colleagues are investigating such a procedure at, at the island of Ameland. Uh, a huge um, uh, sediment supply in an tidal delta over there. Um, of course, it is important that we should take the sediment from outside the system, which is not so simple as it may look, because at the moment when we strengthen a dike, we take sand from the Wadden Sea, or we used to do that, and if we are not to if we should not take sand from out of the system because we then we increase the sediment deficit, we should look for sand from, from some other regions. So now we take it from the North Sea. The problem if we take it from the North Sea, we get problems with our carbon footprint because we have to transport our sediment 50 kilometers to the place where we need it. And we need to transport it. If you take it from the Wadden Sea, you only need to, to transport it by 200 meters. You have a totally different carbon dioxide footprint. So actually it's a complex topic we are talking about. Uh, so, so um, we have some challenges, but we think that in the end we are, thinking, we are talking about sand. So some coming activities. I've all the time been talking about how important is it, it is that we should put sand into the system, and then the first point you see there is that we will not put sand into the system. Actually, that is because we have been working on scenario basis, and we have seen that for the coming two, three, four decades we will not need extra sediment input into the one sea. So our strategy really is a long, long-term strategy, you may call it. I doubt that it will survive in, in, in our political system. We all know how short-term our political system is. But then, uh, perhaps coming back one time to the project that Rudiger already addressed, the Building with Nature project, which is an interact project where we cooperate with a lot of countries uh, around the North Sea, and even Sweden is in it, um, and uh, we are partner as well, of course, and what we investigate is uh, the topic what you see there. We are nourishing 
uh, sand on the beaches of the island of Zult since 40 years now. Uh, in all, we have deposited there 45 million cubic meters of sand now over the last decades. And you see there where we distribute it, so in the middle of the island. On some locations, we have already put 5,000 cubic meters of sand per meter of shoreline. So actually, if, if it would still be there, we, we would have a beach of about 500 meters width. But it's not there, of course. It's eroding because sea level is rising. And the thing about it, where is this sand going? If it goes into the one sea, then actually that is a win-win solution. We perform sand nourishments there to combat coastal retreat. The sand goes into the tidal basins at the backside, and there it combats the sea level rise. So then we have more or less a double functionality of our, uh, um, of our sand nourishments. And that actually is what we are investigating in this, uh, in this multinational project. And with that. I think the battery is almost there. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jacobus. Well, I think you made it clear to all of us, even though I'm sure we all know just how complex these sorts of projects are um, and what the possible pitfalls may be and how much we don't know, actually. And what I also don't know is whether we now have the presentation up. Um, can, we, can we proceed? Do we have it? Yes, in that case, I'd like to give the floor to Sukui, please. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sukui, working for the Korea Marine Environment Management Corporation. We should back to the blue carbon issue today. <laughs> and Today, I'd like to start my presentation by introducing several policies related to marine uh, managing coastal remnants in Korea and then shift and then share our current movement to include blue carbon in our managing targets and specifically in a view of climate change response. Uh, first, the uh, representative uh, um, policy options to manage coastal land in Korea are uh, in investigation, protection, and restoration. Next. At first, uh, since 1999, the coastal land investigation has implemented to understand the current status and shift in coastal tidal flats. And the uh, obtained data was used to, used to facilitate comprehensive and systematic preservation and manage, um, management. This survey usually took about at least seven to eight years to cover whole country. But since 2015, it has changed to be investigated every two years to respond proactively to the rapid change of marine ecosystem. And in addition, four tidal plates as hotspots as was have investigated every year. Next. Mm. From the basic survey, we explored the species composition, biomass, density, or coverage in the microventos and halopites. These basic surveys is, has implemented divide in the coast, domestic coast into two districts. The Suncheonman is the dividing line. Go big back. And then the four tidal plates to be experienced annual survey are Gangwado Island, Garorim, Garorim Bay, and Jingdo Island, and Suncheon Bay in Korean Peninsula. Next. And another option is to designating of marine protected area. The MPA is area within or adjacent to marine environment. And related flora, fauna, historical and cultural features, and which has been reserved by legislation or other effective means. It is most effective policy instrument in preserving biodiversity 
of the Korean, uh, of the coastal and marine ecosystem. According to the IH11, Target 11 of the Convention on Biological Diversity, it requires designate at least 10% of coastal and marine areas as protected areas by 2020. And currently, Korea government has designated 27 sites as MPA as an area of 581 square kilometers. It is located in the southern and western coast of the Korean Peninsula. Then, next. And currently, the tidal pledge has decreased from 3,203 in 1987 to 2,487 in 2013. It's more than uh, more than 20 percent of tidal pledge has decreased by reclamation in Korea. Also, the large area of the tidal flood is highly utilized for fishery in Korea. 40% of the total tidal flood is utilized for fishery, fishing, or aquaculture. As a reference, a recent study on economic value of tidal flood in Korea reported that the potential value of tidal flood has, is of uh, 6.3 billion Korean won per square kilometer. It's uh, about uh, 5.3 million US dollar. And also for obtaining more benefits from coastal wetland, Korea government implements the tidal flood restoration program. It restores the abandoned salt pan or aqua farms. Began with the pilot program on Gochang, Suncheon, and Satcheon. In 2010, the restoration of nine sites had finished, and the six sites are under executing. These three policies mentioned so far are going on to conserve or restore coastal wetland in Korea. Next, please. Now I'd like to add another value to the coastal wetland, which is carbon sequestration by blue carbon. Before I introduce the blue carbon approach in Korea, I shall shortly explain why we are interested in. As a party of UNFCCC, Korea government pledged our greenhouse gas emission uh, reduction target by 37% from uh, business as usual level by 2030. And it is very challengeable target for us. It's almost about 315 million, uh, million ton of carbon dioxide, CO2 equivalent. And also our new administration drives a new energy policy to reduce nuclear and coal power, it makes it more difficult to meet our target. So we, we should find alternative option to reduce or remove greenhouse gas. And so under this situation, we are positively considering the, green, the marine space as mitigation options. Marine ecosystem was relatively uh, considered as an adaptation option before in Korea, but in this research, we are uh, emphasized the capability of carbon CO2 sequestration of marine ecosystem. Okay. Mm Next, the blue carbon is the carbon stored in the mangroves, tidal marsh, and seagrass meadows within the soil and the biomass above and the below ground. And the carbon sequestered in coastal soil remains trapped for a very long period of time and resulting it in very large carbon stocks. Of course, 
Blue Carbon providing several ecosystem services, such as provisioning, regulating, supporting, and cultural functions. Also, the coastal ecosystem is smaller in size to compared to terrestrial forest. The total amount of stored carbon is similar, and the absorption rate is faster than the forest. This map shows the global distribution of blue carbon. Mangroves are usually located in the tropical regions such as Indonesia, Mexico, and Brazil. And the salt marsh is in cigarettes are distributed in more broad region in the world. Korea has just salt marsh and cigarettes, but no mangrove. And according to the existing knowledge on the blue carbon, the salt marsh and sea grasses stores two or three times higher than the forest. The below graph shows uh, was cited from the Blue Carbon Initiative website, and you can find the potential of the soil carbon, com so organic soil carbon, and the higher carbon stocks of them compared to the forest. From the resulting of uh, result of the result uh, published the literature by keywords such as blue carbon, marine, mangroves, etc., the researches has steeply increased since 2000. But and the, the main the mangrove studies uh, was dominate, uh, relatively dominant in others, uh, other means such as salt uh, and seagrasses. Uh, in Korea, the blue carbon research is extremely lack, and uh, moreover, the studies on standardization of the domestic carbon measurement or carbon cycles are very limited. Next. As I mentioned before, we pursue to contribute to the new climate regime. It means Paris Agreement by marine ecosystem management. Under this vision, Korea government has launched blue carbon research. And this year, to include blue carbon in the national greenhouse inventory and uh, accredited as carbon sink in the, glo in the global framework. Creating a carbon inventory for a given area requires understanding for past and present distribution of the coastal vegetated ecosystems, and also it requires current carbon stock, stock and potential carbon emissions by expected changes. The, our, goal, our research goal is to establish climate change response system through uh, blue carbon investigation and the information system. For this goal, to achieve this goal, we implemented three strategic uh, researches. The first one is the establishing information system, and next one is the identification, identifying the carbon cycle in domestic ecosystem. And lastly, we are developing the blue carbon management scheme in our in under our research go into more detail the, regarding the first strategy, strategic research. We will develop, we will develop GIS-based spatial information system on coastal topography and habitat. And also we will develop learning, machine learning algorithm for automatic classification and identifi identification of coastal vegetation and this spatial information and the mapping technology, technology will be a basement of national greenhouse gas inventory for blue carbon in Korea. And second strategy is, for the second strategy, it aims to develop our country-specific and site-specific emission or removal factors of blue carbon. So before, uh, to get this goal, we will develop 
standard, then standard, standardized methodology for field survey and carbon measurement in Korea, and then we will make a carbon cycle model by habitat. Last project is related to the carbon, blue carbon management scheme. It includes the development of MRV methodology for blue carbon and also establishing GHG statistical system in Korea. They currently rewriting creation or vegetation of coastal wetland can be accredited as carbon removal activities in the national inventory by the IPCC guideline. And also, we will follow this way and as a as uh, challengeable step, we hope the blue carbon conservation also to be accredited as a removal activities, such as a red plus on the UNFCCC framework. And so we would like to cooperate global communities to blue carbon communities on blue carbon for our further goals. Last next is uh, this. So our project is planned for five years and the whole uh, total budget is 10 million US dollar. And the annual plan is plotted here for your reference. I'll skip the details and the last slide. It is also uh, all of the I mentioned so far, we are trying to contribute to meet the GHG reduction targets in Korea and also enhancing marine habitat value and establish a basis for conservation policies of marine ecosystem. And the next, few, next step, we would like to develop new projects to mitigate or adapt to climate change in the ocean sector. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. That's certainly a very ambitious agenda, um, and um, it'll be fascinating to see the outcome, of course. It also shows how many different approaches to uh, addressing the, the challenges of climate change we can take. Um, we're now going to start a panel discussion. I had some questions I wanted to ask, actually, but we're running quite late. So um, I'd like to begin by asking the audience if they have any questions. If any of you would like to ask questions, please do so now, because I think it's more important for you to ask questions than for me to do so. So the floor is open. Um, of course, you can ask me questions as well. Please um, go ahead. Yes, please. My name is Katrin Schweiger. Uh, I'm a researcher from Bavaria. So first of all, thank you very much for your insights. Um, my research is centered around mountainous areas, so that's why I'm not completely familiar with the water and sea adaptation strategy. So um, I have a question in terms of, um, you said uh, there is a differentiation between natural and artificial measures to be taken. So could you clarify what an artificial measure actually is and to what extent that goes? Thank you. That's a question for Jacobus, I think. Can I be heard? Yeah. OK, uh, thank you for that question. Um, for me, it's all quite clear, but of course, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to speak up in such a short time. It's about when I was addressing that topic, I was meaning that we can, of course, build uh, foot pavements or strengthening the dikes, uh, making technical measures to combat climate change consequences. Uh, the other way around it is talking about more soft measures, like, um, for example, installing salt marshes, which reduce wave energy. Salt marshes are natural, more are soft techniques. So, uh, sand nourishment, we call them soft techniques as well, because we actually we put sand on a beach, which consists of sand. So we just restore the old situation and then let natural dynamics take over again. And then sometime in future, we'll have to do it again and again and again to combat the sea level rise. So that was thought about the more natural, uh, furthering the natural dynamics or, or helping the natural dynamics. And on the other hand, uh, putting concrete measures like dikes or groins or stone revetments, etc. Is that OK? Thank you, Jacobus. Any other question? 
That doesn't seem to be the case at the moment, so let's start our discussion. Let me ask a question first of all, which I think is interesting to all of us. And actually, it's a question that's virtually impossible to answer, um, at least to, do so, uh, to, to answer briefly. But what are the specific challenges posed by climate change in coastal areas in the Wadden Sea region, in Korea, and in Australia? And maybe we can start with Donovan. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. The, the emerging, I mean, the, the usual issues that we see, you know, are, are increased tropical cyclones. Uh, we have uh, uh, thousands of kilometres, you know, of erosion risk and inundation risk. But the, the risk that's materialising now is actually at that interface with human settlements. So um, it is the risk of uh, insurance, uh, the risk of uh, mortgage risk coming from the extreme events. So that's what we're seeing at the moment. And just briefly, because it's, um, you know, we love living by the coast in Australia, um, if any uh, government tells us that we can't live there and then we have to do planned retreat, then it becomes a political issue very, very quickly. Thank you. What about Korea then? What are the specific challenges or wh what is the single most important challenge that you think you need to address in coastal areas in Korea? Right. Also, Korea also experienced this deep sea level rise also, and we are especially the southern and Jeju Island is experienced more than three times faster than global average. So we are doing some um, politic, uh, no, the policies to, to protect the coastal areas by make join, joining for protection like that. And also we are experiencing recently very high, very high sea water temperature recently and it just so we launched our early warning system just two years before to warn the high sea, uh, sea water temperature to reduce the damages in the aquaculture or fishing sectors. Thank you very much. And Jacobus for the one sea region. Yes, um, well, quite clearly, I've been already been addressing the topic of sediment deficits in, as a consequence of uh, sea level rise, which is a topic that I'm familiar with. Uh, I think when you really talk about major challenges for the Wadden Sea, you should put on two more. That is, the one thing is the rising temperatures of the air, but also of the water, of course, which will lead to a totally different uh, ecosystem. And um, this, uh, that's the second uh, extra thing is, I think, exiting exiditation, how do you call it? Exid exidification. exidification, thank you. <laughs> um, which is uh, really going to, at least from, from a worldwide perspective, which is a, a major uh, a challenge. Uh, with respect to sea level rise, I've been talk ta talking about an adaptation strategy. With respect to uh, increasing water temperatures and the other topic uh, that she knows better than I do how to pronounce that, uh, is um, that you cannot actually do much about it. You can only uh, adapt to the consequences, I think. So what uh, every now and then you should start thinking about accepting something and uh, we will have to accept that the water temperatures will increase, I suppose. And as a consequence of increasing water temperatures, you will have a changing biosystem and there will be no way around it. So I think you will have to more or less accommodate to this new situation. And that was what I was already addressing at the beginning, that we always aim to preserve what we see at this moment. And actually, uh, the world is a changing system. It has been changing all the time, and it will change in the future. The only thing what we put on top of it, on top of it is our an anthropogenic climate change. And in those places where we cannot really avoid that something will happen, uh, we will have to accommodate to this new situation. So if, if new, new um, uh, flora and fauna will come into the Wadden Sea, and uh, if it is in conflict with the World Natural Heritage Site, then of course you could say, well, okay, we skip the World Natural Heritage Site because uh, the, the, the biosystem is a different one as we, as we wanted to, uh, 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 to safeguard more or less. And that, uh, of course, is, is something that will go into, how do you call it, a zakasse, Rudiga? Uh, um, dead end dead street, end. which is dead a dead end. end street, more or less. You will always lose. I think that, that is perhaps one major challenge, which would then be the fourth challenge, more or less in our heads, that we always want to preserve what we have, and we do not think so much about uh, natural dynamics and developments. Okay, that's from my point, perhaps. 
Thank you, Jacobus. Um, I, I think you've actually touched on a number of, of hot issues, of, of contentious issues, and that's why I'd like to ask um, whether any of the, 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 the panelists would like to comment on that, and then I'd also like to take questions from the audience if there are any. Is anybody in the pan panel? Nobody wants to comment. Is there anybody in the audience who'd like to ask uh, for additional clarification or maybe comment on, on what has just been said? Also regarding biodiversity, yes, please. Hello. Um, I'm not quite sure if this is the right panel to ask the question, but uh, maybe it is. <laughs> so I'm um, talking about challenges. Uh, what about the finance uh, challenges for those projects? Um, yeah. Thank are you. there any, and if yes, what are the challenges? Well, well, the first question um, I can I can certainly answer. Yes, there are, um, and the those are challenges uh, as well. So, um, funding finding the funding for that is a challenge in itself. But maybe the panelists would would like to reply as well. Donovan? Yeah, that's a really contentious question uh, in Australia. So, um, everyone wants adaptation. You know, they want to protect their foreshore. They want to protect the natural environment, but nobody actually wants to pay for it. Um, in Australia, you know, we're teasing out public-private partnership options. Um, there's a community up in far north Queensland that um, actually got given the land from the state government and they have built their own seawall. Um, they, they have to manage it, they have to insure it themselves. But for the state government and, and for the local government, you know, that was a partnership because the state and local government didn't want to um, do that. So, um, you know, they're really expensive, you know, uh, any seawall that you develop, say a physical infrastructure, have trade-offs. You know, they damage the natural environment. They have um, a cascading impacts on the neighbouring properties. In um, in Byron Bay, the local government created a seawall that has damaged um, a. Unfortunately, it was it damaged the property of a, um, a Queen's Council a solicitor. So. You know, he's taken them to court in a multi-million dollar challenge and has won. You know, this case is ongoing, but he's won the first stage of it. And so, yeah, finance is very, very difficult. Um, just quickly, for local governments um, in Australia, the, uh, they get a lot of their money from their, probably 80% of their income comes from rateable property values. So it's like a land tax that gets paid to the city government. Now, if um, climate change has uh, ramifications on the property values, so if something stops becoming insurable or becomes a mortgage risk, then the property values may go down and then the, the cities will get less money. There are some um, uh, anecdotal evidence of some local governments hiding that information because they're protecting their own income source as well. So, so it gets quite uh, complicated. At the moment, the local governments are expecting that the state and the federal government is going to come to to you know bail them out but you know we have 400,000 homes exposed to sea level rise that's just one climate change issue and there's not enough money in the world to deal with that thank you Donovan would any of the other panelists like to reply Jacobus okay um, I think in, in, in Germany you have, uh, at least with respect to coastal protection and coastal flood defense, we have actually quite a good uh, situation there. Uh, quite a lot of uh, funding of coastal defense infrastructures is funded by state, and they get uh, co-financing from the federal government and then even from the EU. And at the moment it is like, um, it, I think it's always what actually is at stake. And when we are talking about coastal flood defense, about uh, keeping people's feet dry and, and protecting lives from, from flooding. Uh, it, it, it is quite clear that when you see the challenge of climate change that something needs to be done. And actually since 2009, uh, the German sta coastal states and German federal government has installed an extra financing scheme for uh, coastal flood defense. So at the moment about 20% of our what we what we spend each year on, uh, on, on investments for coastal flood defense comes from an extra uh, from an extra uh, funding mechanism, which is actually is for climate change adaptation. And in Schleswig-Holstein, for example, we use this money that uh, whenever we need to strengthen a dike, when a dike is not safe anymore, we need to, to do something about this dike. We, we first design, of course, the new dike, and then we say, okay, now we put half a meter on top of the, of the crest in order to, uh, to uh, balance out the sea level rise of half a meter. 
So we use this money to make the dikes higher than we would actually would need to build them to have present safety standards. We use even some more money to flatten the outer dike slope so that we have an extra, uh, we call it, or a, a building reserve, we call it. So we, we have about 20% of our money goes into climate change adaptation at the coast. I think this is totally unique at least uh, in Germany with respect to climate change adaptation. I do not need know about any other sector where already extra investments are being done to adapt to climate change. Uh, I, I work in this, this national uh, water management uh, uh, association and um, I'm normally the only one who can really show uh, an example of where we invest money for climate change adaptation in the water sector. Thank you. Any other comments from the panel? You can, I'll, I'll just add one more comment around the financing. Uh, you know, um, there's some interesting mechanisms out there. So one of the answers to, um, say, uh, paying for adaptation is to intensify property develop development on the foreshore to pay for the, for the adaptation. Um, uh, and you know that's a topical issue because the people that live on the coast don't want to have too many other people living next door to them, but they you know want they also want their coastal sort of defences. Thank you. Does that answer your question, or okay? Okay. Thank you. First of all, it's quite interesting. Um, also, because as far as I know, in um, in Denmark, for instance, there's the beneficiary pays uh, principle, so every landowner has to pay their own uh, prevention measures. So, uh, right now, we have a situation where most of the times the co uh, the the central and the local government jointly um, finance or fund those projects. But yeah, we also see in the case of Denmark, um, yeah, nations and states where it's where it's the way around, which is causing problems. Um, but my problem, uh, my question would be, um, as it seems we have like a money abundancy in, in terms of um, cost uh, adaptation, and well, we don't need extra funding. So um, in in Germany, just saying, um, how is it? Um, there are always more regions and uh, places that would that will need um, adaptation measures. So how do you? How do you um, allocate the money that you have if it's limited? So, what criteria do you use to say I protect these ones, but I don't protect the other ones? Would anybody uh, like to answer? Yeah, that's a tricky question. Usually, it's um, the person that has the most. You know, it's the rich and and those that have the most influence. You know, with the politicians. You know, to be frank, you know that that often happens. Um, the disadvantaged, you know, uh, or the disenfranchised usually miss out. It's a very tricky one. So, uh, as I said before, people want everything, but they don't want to pay for it. Um, yeah, it's uh, um, at the, from what I've seen so far, the decision criteria has been purely political. Thank you, Jakobus. Okay, just short from, from Germany, it's like uh, when we coastal risk management authorities say a dike is not strong enough, then we uh, make our own uh, priority listing more or less when we look at damage expectations, of course, where are the most people effective, where are the most damage expectations in terms of capital values. We, we, we should start there. So that's the starting point. And then it becomes complicated because then we are going to start talking to the people, to the population. And then you have a very strong mayor with a direct contact, you have a, a more weaker mayor who has who, who doesn't is not so much interested in coastal risk management, so there you get the first diversion. Then the second diversion is that quite a lot of people don't want more uh, because it interferes with their view on the sea and things like that, so then you leave that area as well. And then, and then this whole complicated thing about uh, what we always say, like integrated coastal zone management comes. You start talking, you start discussing. Um, and then in the end you find out that you are strengthening a dike on that location and when you would frankly ask me what was the priority of that location has it been done because of that priority I can hardly address that so it's, it's not so much a logical uh, process it's more a, 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 I would say a discussion process where you strengthen your dikes it is different for example in the Netherlands where you have these weak links which because it's a bit more pronounced, uh, pro how do you call it, in, f in front, it's more in the attention of course, so there you have a bit more funding even, so you can do more things at the same time. Uh, another 
topic that makes it much more complicated. For example, if you start to perform your plan, produce, pro plan uh, approval procedure, so if you go into the actual formal procedure, then you have some uh, uh, s campaigns which go like that. You don't have any complaints. And then you have other areas where you're going into Natura 2000 areas, where you're going into build-up areas, where you're much more interfering. Uh, your plan approval procedure may take 12 years or the whole process to get the plan through. So uh, it's always the starting point is logically, and then in the ending point after the dike has been strengthened, it looks totally different. And I know that that is similar in Denmark as well, although there they have this, this three division of, of financing. I don't know whether it really helps, but... <laughs> yeah. D Donovan, you look like you want to add something. No, okay. okay. So yes, we've, we've now run out, of t uh, run out of time, so I'm, I'm not going to deliver any long summary. What I think we can see, of course, and that's something we all know, that climate change challenges all of us. There's a wide variety of approaches to, to addressing it, and, and even modes and levels of funding differ widely among these three regions. What we all see, though, I think, is the sense of urgency in, in addressing it, and, and th I think that's common ground, and that's something we can build on, and that's what makes me optimistic that we will find solutions, creative and innovative solutions, in due course. I'd like to thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank our panelists uh, for their presentations today, and now I'd like to inform you that if everything has gone according to plan, which everything did not today so far, <laughs> there should be refreshments outside, so if you have any, any further questions that you'd like to address to the panelists individually, we can do it out there. Do we have refreshments, Harald? Yes, okay, so you're welcome to help yourselves. Thank you very much. <laughs>